to share with you a message that the Lord put on my heart. And it's about being sold out to God. How many know it's important to be sold out? Amen. Amen. If, if, if you stick around in those comfort zones, you know what the comfort zones are? They're breeding grounds for mediocrity. They're breeding grounds to be unfulfilled and to live a life of mediocrity in, in the things of God. Stay out of the comfort zones. Push yourself. Pray, seek the Lord, and He will guide you and direct your path. If all of your whole circle of friends are all tucked away in their little comfort zones, you can keep those friends. I'm not saying get rid of those friends, but how about going out and finding some friends that are that have got it going on a little bit more than you do? Got a little bit more fire, got a little bit more energy. Get around them a little more. Let, let what's in them jump off on you. You can only stand to hear you can only hear hear their story so many times of how, how they were in Walmart and, and God laid them on their heart. They prayed for someone, someone was healed right at Walmart. You keep hearing those stories, you might want to try that someday. Right? Stay out of the mediocrity circles and in the comfort zones. I remember at one time Sister Denise, she she spoke up here and she said, the Lord told her this. The Lord said, There's good things outside of the comfort zones, but you gotta go out there and get them. Nobody can bring them into you. And isn't that the truth? Yeah. And to when you're sold out to God, you can find a treasure. A treasure of peace, a treasure of joy, a treasure of fulfillment, a treasure of passion. A lot of people, they want to do things for the Lord, but you know what? They don't have the passion. In other words, they don't have the, the, the gas in the tank to go anywhere. And it's because they haven't sold out. They haven't said, not my will, but your will be done, God. Not, not what I want to do, but let's have it be what you want me to do. This is what God wants from all of us. If you give God 75% of your life, you're going to be disappointed because he's God. He should have 100% of our lives. I'm reminded of, of a Spanish um, captain or, or a, 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 a man by the name of Cortez. And in 1519, Cortez sailed from Spain to Mexico. In 1519, he had 11 ships, 500 men. And he was going to the Yucatan on, on the coast of Mexico. What he was after was the world's largest treasure that the Aztec kingdom held. The Aztec Indians had the world's largest treasure. They were a great empire. For 600 years, many people tried and failed to defeat that nation, and they were after their treasure. And so Cortez comes, comes in, his, in 11 ships, he had 500 men and 100 sailors. And he, and he comes to the coast of, uh, of Mexico there, and, and they get off the ships, and then what he does next, he takes the option of quitting off the table. You know what he did? He burned the ships. That's what that says, by the way, burn the ships if you can't read it. He burned the ships. How many know that your, your uh, commitment level will rise when you ain't got no way home <laughs> and you've only got to go forward? And, and Cortez said, if we're going home, we're going home in their ships. We're going home in their ships. He took the option of quitting and going back off of the table. And you know what? Cortez and, and his 500 men defeated that army. They won. They defeated the Aztecs, who for 600 years nobody could defeat. That's what God's asking us to do. He's asking us to burn the ships. He's asking us to take quitting off of the table. He's asking us to, to practice our purpose. To live for Him with all of our heart, all of our mind. Stop looking back. Only go forward. Live the sold out life. What ships you have in your harbor, I don't know. What ships I have in my harbor, you don't know. But the Holy Spirit knows. Mm -hmm. And when you pray and talk to the Lord, He will lead you. And He will guide you. But I'm telling you, those ships or those way out that you have will do you no good. Sometimes our ships are our old friends that we want to keep hanging out with. The old friends are up to no good. Uh-oh. No one in here. There's old friends that ain't up, they're up to no good. You know, sometimes you've got to burn those ships. Sometimes you've got you to say, you know what? I, I, I'll hang around them a little bit, but I'm not going over there and being subjected to those things that...
mindset that God delivered me from. Amen. I'm going to go forward in the things of God. I'm going to practice my purpose. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to truly live for Him. When you do, you'll find a treasure. It is a, it is a treasure that only comes from being sold out. I'm telling you, it's the most wonderful, most um, liberating experience to finally say, God, I'm done with it. Some, sometimes people in their marriage, they're not sold out in their marriages. They're, they're, they got a door open that maybe they can escape someday. You got to burn that ship. Yes. Because that door that you're leaving for a way of escape someday is keeping you from putting all your energy into the marriage that God put together. You got to say, I'm in it. No matter what. And I will fight tooth and nail. I will scratch. I will crawl. I will claw. I will scratch the devil's eyes out if I have to. But I am living for God and my marriage will be blessed with the Lord. Got to watch that spirit of discouragement. Discouragement comes into our lives and it takes our attention off of what God's done for us, what God wants to do through us, and all we can think about is, is, is what happened to us. We've got to burn the ships. We've got to practice our purpose. Look in your Bibles here at Luke chapter 4, verse 8, and I'll give you the perfect, the perfect scripture for practicing your purpose. The Lord just added this into my message right before I came out here. He said, give him that one. That, that'll explain what it means to practice your purpose. How many of you are going to practice your purpose more than ever? You're going to do what God called you to do. Sometimes people, they say, well, I want a position. I want a title. I, I want this or that. No, just try to be the best person you can be for your church. Don't try to be the best in the church. Try to be the best for the church. It's okay to want things and to want, want, want to do things for God, but, but you've got to practice your purpose first. Or else the position or the title or the thing will, will come in and, and, and consume your mind. And then you'll miss the work right before you. If you, you go ahead and everybody look around. This is the work. This is your family. This is the house of Jesus Christ. These are your brothers and sisters. These are your brothers and sisters in arms. These are who, people who God called you to, to go to war with, to go to battle with. That's right. These are the people, the Bible talks about it all the time, the household of faith, and to do good, especially to those of the household of faith. Talks about it all the time. You, you, can't, you can't overlook your family. The Bible says a person that doesn't take care of their family is worse than an infidel. I believe that talks about the spiritual family too. You gotta practice your purpose. And burn those ships. Some of us have ships in the harbor with the big flag that says offense. Watch out. I'm gonna sound the alarm. Watch out for that spirit of offense. It is a kicker. It is mean. Nasty, horrible. It will take what someone has done for them, good for all, for many, many years, and focus on one wrong thing and throw everything away. It will turn a heart into stone. I will go ahead and burn that ship and say, no matter what happens from this day forward, I will never allow myself to get offended. If someone offends me, I will do what the Bible says to do. First, I'll pray for them. If I still can't shake it, I will go to them. And I will talk to them. And I will reason with them. And if that don't work, I'll go get some leaders of the church and we'll do it again. But I will not allow that ship to be in my harbor anymore. Amen. I've seen that spirit of offense take a lot of people down. Sometimes they get offended at me. Who would get offended at me? <laughs> Sometimes when you have to say no, that's all you need to do. I had a minister, uh, one of the instructors at Ramah, he said, if you're going to be a good pastor, you've got to learn one word. No. I said, okay. And you do. For truly, I'm here to serve you, 
to be the best I can be for you. I've burned a lot of ships to be here. But it's God first for me. It has never been about people first. Put God first and then you do what you have to do. Amen? Amen. While you love everybody in, in the process. But look at, look at Luke 4 verse 8. Jesus replied, the scripture said, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only Him. That's your purpose. How many know you got to practice that purpose? When, I, when, when the Lord called me to Rama, you know what I was doing? Practicing my purpose here. Practicing my purpose. Serving, helping any way I can. I wasn't like that my whole life, my, my entire life. It, but, but a few years earlier, I, I was on my kitchen floor and I said, Lord, I'm never going back. I burned my ships. And you know, this is 17, 18 years later, I never went back. I, I, I was far from perfect, but I never went back. If I fell, if I faltered, I went to God, just like the scriptures say. I went to the throne of grace and found help in my time of need. And I, and I didn't quit. I didn't give up on God. You know, one thing that, that, I, that, I, um, that I had determined, when the Lord called me to go to, go to, go to Ramah, I was practicing my purpose. And, and when he called me to go, I went out and, 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 I, and I did it. I did it. I had to rent a U-Haul, though. He didn't send the chariot that he raptured Elijah in for me. And I didn't show up at Rama and this big fireball of glory. Well, in my heart, I did it. But just walking around, I was just a regular Joe Spo. Just walking around. Just like the rest of them. But I really, I wasn't just, I mean, really, I was special. Everybody's special, right? And so we ran into you all. And, and I packed my four kids up and we went across the country. 1,200 miles. Did you ever drive a U haul that far? <laughs> Don't do it unless you're called to do it. <laughs> that was before the days of cell phones, believe it or not. Maybe other people said cell phones, but I didn't. And Dad was, was gracious enough to take us out there. Dad was leading the way. And, and, but some of those cities, you got to go through Columbus and Indianapolis and, and, and all these cities. And I'm driving this gigantic U-Haul. And you got to watch out for you know, people. They don't care. They, they, don't, they just take their life in their own hand and fly all over the place. And, and sometimes I couldn't see Dad. And, and I would be like, if I lose him, I don't know where I'm going. I, I, could, I might end up in Kentucky. I don't know. I mean, it was stressful. But yet I'm following the will of God for my life. See, when you sell out to God and you practice your purpose, God will speak to you and he'll put a fire in your bones and he'll put a purpose in your heart that no one can take away. And then we rolled into, we rolled into a place called uh, Quail Hall. And, and, and when I pulled in there, I'm like, this isn't it. This can't be it. No. It was it. That was back when I just started getting, I just got a computer and I was going, I was proud of myself. I got on the internet and I, and I, and I, and I actually found this place over the internet. Never even seen it before. And I wasn't going to take an extra trip out there to try, you know, that's the wrong way. So I, I just found a place and I found out one day. They pay people a lot of money to pay, make places look better than they are. A lot better. Because on the internet, it had this nice play area. I mean, it was beautiful. When I got there, it was one rundown swing set with garbage dumpsters there. And everybody walked their dogs and didn't clean up after them. Landmines everywhere. <laughs> there wasn't no playing in that part. But I'm like, that's not what they said. And then the pool, it was this big, beautiful pool on the internet. Man, it might as well have just been a bathtub. <laughs> It was so small. But I'm following the will of God. Now, that, that didn't change. Remember now, God didn't send me the chariot. But that's okay. He didn't send anybody else one either, I don't think. When you go to 
to follow the will of God, sometimes you've got to put the rubber to, to, to the road and the pedal to the metal. Yeah, right? Metal. <laughs> Never mind. Something. <laughs> and so, was that was it? Okay. Yeah, was it. And so, I, I walk into the office, right? I, I'm fried. Anybody ever know what that means? Your brain's just like fried. It's like, I'm like a zombie. <laughs> Literally. Driving 1,200 miles with, with four children and make it like that. No offense, kids. Maybe. And and I had this one CD from David Ingalls. I played it. I played it the whole trip. Cause I love David Ingalls, and it was a good. It soothed my soul and helped me on my journey. Then when I got the rainbow, we got settled in. I was looking for the CD and I couldn't find it. Years later, the kids told me they took it out in the backyard and buried it. <laughs> I guess that was always fair. <laughs> so, and so I, I walk into the office and I'm like, ta-da, here I am. Who's that mighty mouse? It's come the same day. I didn't say that. But I'm in there, you know, following God's will. And, and, and she looks at me in the face and she says, well, your apartment's not ready yet. The paint's wet. And I said, no. <laughs> no, you got to no. We talked yesterday. And I said I was coming in today and you said everything would be okay. And now I'm here with the fried brain. And I just want to lay down and you tell me I can't get in. So I walk out dejected and I'm telling dad the news and there's this old timer there. And, and he says, I'll find you a place to stay tonight. And so dad gave me two instructions. Make sure we can turn the U-Haul and everything around it in there, big parking lot. So when we pulled up on this place, it had a gigantic parking lot. I thought, one done, one done, we can turn around in there. And then he said, it should have been simple. He said, make sure it's a nice place. <clears throat> well, I didn't actually ask to look into the rooms. It looked nice. It looked okay. And so we booked these rooms, and, and, and the kids, and it says they had a jacuzzi and everything. I'm, think, I'm thinking a place that has a jacuzzi can't be that bad. And so we go into the, we go into the, this place is called the Canterbury Inn. It's still there. Sometimes when I'm out there, I take a picture of it and send it to the kids. <laughs> <clears throat> Don't go to the Canterbury Inn. Because when we opened that door, I had this feeling, ooh, something, something nasty probably happened in here. <laughs> terrible. It's just like, mm. And of course, the kids, they run right to the jacuzzi. And they turn that on, and they go, you know, and it starts spitting out orange and yellow water. And I'm like, turn it off, turn it off. They still want to get in there, believe it or not. No, you're not getting in there. And I said, look, we're all sleeping on top of the covers tonight, and we're sleeping in our clothes. <laughs> but I was following the will of the Lord. I mean, I was on the path. I was on that path. I'm glad I burned some ships because I might have said, Dad, take me home. <laughs> <laughs> but I made a commitment. It didn't bother the kids because they're just, they're just in it, you know. But, and, and so <clears throat> when I got there, the first thing I said to my mom when we went into this big, beautiful church, I said, Mom, see those ushers? I'll never be one of them. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Don't have the need to be seen like that. Not that they did, but... One, 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 one my ML, one my, one my thing. I like to sit in the back and don't be noticed. I made it the whole way through basic training without the drill sergeant knowing my name. <clears throat> well, almost. About a week before the end of basic training, I woke up one morning and forgot my locker combination. Out of the blue. Anybody ever have that happen? Mm -hmm. Just out of the blue. <laughs> Couldn't remember it. <clears throat> Didn't have it written down. <clears throat> now I'm older now. I write it down too. I'm wiser. 
So I had to go into the drill, drill sergeant and ask him for my combination, and then of course he got on me. Then he knew my name. But I was good at sliding by. But guess what? God didn't call me to Rama to slide by. <clears throat> He's like, I want you to keep burning those ships. I want you to burn those ships. And so <clears throat> it took me two weeks, and finally I said, okay, Lord, I'll go. I'll, I'll be an usher. And I drug my feet. True story. And, and, and so I walk into the ushers meeting, and they're already established. There's 40 or 50 of them, student ushers. They're already a team. They're already practiced. They're already together. <clears throat> and then here comes me two weeks late. And there was another guy. His name was Mark. He came at the same time I did. He was new. And Mark knew what was going on. Because he looked at me and he said, you too, huh? You too, huh? I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the Lord was dealing with me two weeks to be here. You too, huh? Yeah, me too. And so we go in there and we sit down in the back behind all the ushers. And the head student usher, I wasn't, we weren't in there for five minutes. And he, and he called us out. And in and, 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 and a, and a wrong, negative way. And he said, you do guys that come, I don't know if you're just here so you can, you can, you can usher a winter Bible seminar if you want the front seat, but I want to tell you something. I'm giving it to the people that's been here all this time. You're, I'll find a place. He's calling us out like that. And I'm like, dude, you don't know me. You don't know where I've come from. You don't know what God took, it took for God to get me here. You don't know the people that are counting on me and, and what the battles I've been through. I'm saying, I'm saying all this stuff to myself. I wasn't going to say it to him because I wasn't there to get in an argument. I wasn't there to defend myself. I was there to do the will of God. But my flesh was having a hard time. I calmed I calm Mark down. I was pretty happy with myself. Because <laughs> Mark was going to go up. And I said, if anybody, anybody that knows me knows that I don't have a need to be seen. That's why the Lord put me here. Terribly offensive. This is a Rama Bible Training Center. The best Bible school in the world, in my opinion. <clears throat> Big, sharp offense hit my, came my way, and, and I was able to reason in my heart, reason in my mind, I'm going to burn that ship. I'm going to burn it. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm, Lord, I'm here for you. And my whole time there, you know what decisions I made, what pur I purposed in my mind? No matter what circumstance I was in, and no matter what negative thing was spoken to me, I, I, I did not let it change the, the fact in my mind and my heart that I was where God wanted me to be. I was in His will. Yeah. And no one was going to knock me out of it. Mm. Because when I sold out to God and started burning those ships, God spoke to me. And He used me. I knew I, I, knew I had people counting on me. Look at this next scripture, Isaiah 52, 14. <clears throat> I'm going to ask if uh, Sinona will come up for a while. Sinona's going to sing <clears throat> a song. It's actually the anthem. It's the song that um, they sang all week for um, um, Vacation Bible School. Hey, you know the scripture says that a little child will lead them? Isaiah 52, verse 14. And I want to say something while you're going there. There was other times as an usher, and they weren't just student head ushers, they were head ushers of all of Ramah that acted, that offended me and acted inappropriately. Now, it's a wonderful school, a wonderful place. If you look on some of them old Kenneth Hagin CDs or YouTube things, some of those ushers, you'll see them right there walking right with Brother Hagin. <clears throat> well, what did I say? No matter what circumstance I was in, no matter what negative words were spoken to me, I didn't let it change the fact that I was in God's will. Now, it didn't happen a lot, but the point is it happened. My overall experience there was the greatest of my life. The Hagans are wonderful, but they can't be everywhere at the, at the same time, can they? Mm -mm. They're working with people like we're working with people. Mm -hmm. They're working, they're growing up human flesh like we are, or trying to help people out of that. 
You gotta, you gotta burn some ships, or else you're gonna be easy pickings for the devil. Right. You can't come in here and jump and shout, praise the Lord, and not have burned ships, because, because the devil's gonna find a way to knock you out sooner or later. <clears throat> Look at Isaiah fifty-two fourteen. But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know that he was a man. You know what this is a description of? This is the New Living Translation. This is a description of what they did to Jesus Christ on the cross. You couldn't even recognize him as a human being. He was beaten so severely. He did that for me. He died for me like that. I can live for him. Brother Brian was here a few weeks ago and been a good time with Brother Brian. Brother Brian does a lot of work over in the Middle East. And, and he's hooked up with one of the most renowned archaeologists <coughs> in, in the world. You know the movie Passion for Christ, Passion of Christ, whatever it was called, Mel Gibson's movie? This was the man that Mel Gibson um, consulted with to do the movie. He's an expert on the crucifixion. An expert over in the Middle East. They're over in the Middle East right now because some of the some of the leaders of the nations asked them to come and to help them. And and, and this 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 archaeologist took Brian to this place that on the wall was all these instruments, all these weird looking, terrible looking instruments of, of just things, just all of them just nailed on the wall. And Brian said, "What are they?" And he said, they're, they're all the instruments that they use when they crucify Christ. These are all the torture things that they use to torture him. And Brian went on to say, you know the passion of Christ? Passion of Christ? That's the G version. PG version. It's the, it's, it's the watered down version. And see, the archaeologist went on to explain to Brian, he said, the, the execution or the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was was documented. It's one of the most documented events in history. Back then, everybody had scribes. You know what scribes are? People that write down everything that goes on. Everybody had scribes. The Romans had scribes. Um, the 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 uh, the high priest had scribes. The, the the Jewish council had scribes. And anybody that was in there had anything to do with that. They had everybody keeping records of what happened. And those records are now in the Vatican. They're in the Vatican, but nobody, you can't get in there to see them unless you have a high, high level clearance. This guy does. And so he's reading this, and he's seeing all that they did for Jesus. He said, there's something so gruesome, I won't even put it on the wall. I won't even put it up on the wall of what our Lord went through. He said the scribes said that the, that the Roman gladiators were used to beat Jesus. And their freedom was on the line. The one who could inflict the most pain or do the most damage could be free. Mm -hmm. We were not brought into some mansy pansy religion here. This isn't religion. This is real life here. Mm -hmm. And Jesus went all through all of that for me and for you. And his body was marred and, and, and scarred and, and, and battered so you couldn't even recognize him. He's asking us for that kind of a commitment too. Isn't he? You know, I was telling the men and men and brothers, you know what our commitment's going to be here mostly? We live in the greatest country in the world. Chances are pretty, pretty high we're not going to face any kind of physical punishment for our faith. But do you remember the, the rich young man that came to Jesus? And he said, what do I need to do? And Jesus said, well, you need to give up all your goods and all your, all your riches and follow me. And the rich young man went away sad. In other words, he wouldn't burn some ships. God's not telling you to give away all your stuff. But what he's saying is, if you have anything over me or anything more important than me, you're not worthy of me, Jesus said. In other words, you'll never find me. You'll never find the sacrificial love of God that runs deep if you're holding out. Did Jesus hold out for us? 
The rich, the rich young man went away sad. I wonder what he thinks about that decision today. Jesus tells the one church in Revelations, he says, look, he says, you think you're so rich. And he's, you think you're, you're so well to do and all this. He said, but you don't know that you're, that you're poor. You're blind. You're naked. You have nothing. And he said, repent and come to me. There should be nothing over our relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing. No person, place, or thing. And as you follow him in that way, he brings a treasure into you of glory, of joy, of peace, of passion. He puts the gas in your tank to do what God's called you to do. Vince Lombardi once said, everybody wants to win. Everybody has that. It's not the want to, the will to win that matters. It's the will to prepare to win. There's a lot of Christians that want to do all these things for the Lord and want to experience all these things. And they got things in their minds and things in their heart, but, but they don't have the will, the will to say, not my will, but your will. And to press into God as he wants us to. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you one more story before Sedona sings. Brian was saying that when he went into these Muslim places, he said that they're skittish or standoffish when they come in, especially the women. He says, because if they would convert to Christianity, some of these Muslim nations, what they do to them immediately is they tattoo them in the arm, right here in the right arm, because they do everything with their right arm. And it's basically a death tattoo. And they're not allowed to work. They're not allowed to make a living. Their families disown them. If they convert to Christ, they truly forsake all for Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And you know where they, many of them live? They live in the garbage dumps. Mm -hmm. If I were over there, I'd live in the garbage dumps too, <coughs> rather than deny Jesus Christ. Yeah. We're living in a world where it takes sacrifice, it takes commitment, it takes, it takes determination. If we're not going to burn our ships now, when are you going to burn your ships? We're living in the last days. I saw on the news of over half a million acres in California has already been burned in these fires. There's fires everywhere. In San Francisco, you can't even get on the, on the, you know those famous trolleys that you see look so pretty and so nice? Now you know what they say over the intercom when you get on those trolleys? Watch out for needles. Make sure you don't sit on needles. There's so many people shooting up over there living on the streets. Well, there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people dying of opioid addictions right now, today, even in this community. If we're not going to burn our ships, when will we? The reason I didn't get upset at that usher or quit along the way is because I knew that, that, that you were counting on me. I'm not doing this for myself. I'm doing it for you. And in doing it for you, I get fulfilled. Jesus didn't die on the cross for himself. He died for you. Doing the will of the Father. There have been many times I've, I've done funerals and I've looked in the casket. I've been, I'm, I'm at a casket of somebody who died way too young. And I'm standing there with their children. looking into that casket, wondering why their mom and their dad had to die. They didn't have to die. We can't get so comfortable that we say, us for and no more. Because I want to tell you, it could be easy for this church to ride out the way we are right now and not pursue and push for this, for this building. It's going to cost nearly $600,000 or more. It's only money. We gotta look past the price, look past the building, and look to the souls that are gonna be in the building. So many times people say, you know, I wanna do this for the Lord, and I wanna do that for the Lord. Well, I'll tell you what you do. Practice your purpose. Worship God with all of your heart. Take care of your family first, and then take care of your church. 
And then God will continue to speak to your heart and give you inspiration, give you passion, because you're not going to do it without the passion. You'll get knocked out the game. You know what it was like for me sitting there is just this, this nobody in this big place called Ramah to have a head usher call me out like that and totally, totally misjudge me, didn't even know me to do something. I'm a pastor, and I had a, I've had always had a pastor heart. Even I knew that that was wrong. And to embarrass me and my friend. But I said, God, he didn't call me here, you did. And I'm staying here. And I wanna, I wanna, I'm not better than anybody else that's here, but I want to tell you something else. There's nobody else here better than me either. Some people went, and some people were sent. I was sent so that I could be right here. Amen. Would you rise, please? I want to worship the Lord together. And, and if you can't worship with Sidonia as we sing this song, then I'm going to wrap it up when I'm done. And you know what? This is the anthem. This is what the children sang all week long. And, and, and remember, remember our youth pastor and his wife and, and, and his people that work with our children. Pray for them. Pray for them always. Amen? Mm -hmm. Let's worship the Lord together. I'm going to share a small testimony of, of what's been happening in our life. Yes, um, lately, um, the Holy Spirit um, has been talking to me and the calling in my life, like my purpose. I know, uh, like, you know that uh, God gave me a gift to share with you, my blessing, like singing. And um, so, this past couple of weeks, um, like hearing Pastor John's service, his CDs, and Pastor George last time his message, and also Brother Bill's when he was here. He's been talking about me, about the purpose in my life. And um, so I know I had the faith, but uh, some of you might not know that I have some. I hold it now here, but uh, God told me that um, in order, I have to use my faith and I have to walk within my faith. And so, lately um, at work, just doing baby step, like if my residents are in pain or anxious, worried, or when they're sick, I've been praying for them, and just uh, the other day, one of my residents, while I was feeding him in the, his room, he was just crying in pain, and I said, what's wrong? And he said that, um, my eyes is boring, it's hurting, and I said, what I can do for you? And they called the nurse, so I called the nurse, and she said that, um, let me look if I have medicine for it. And so she called me back and she said, actually I don't have pain medication for that. So I asked the guy and I said, can I pray for you? And she said, yeah, sure. So I hold his right eye and I prayed for his healing. And then I, after I did pray for him, he thanked me. And then so after that I left, in his room and then an hour later I check him again and I, I asked him if how's his eyes doing and he said actually it's doing better and he said thank you mm -hmm. so you know um, I heard Pastor John's message he said that mm, not just all pastor are, can do that and he said I we can do that also so I've been hearing that in my ear, so I was his faith to do that, but I do it anyway. <laughs> and then the other day, also one of our residents, she was like screaming for help, so I asked her, and so she said, I want to lay down in bed, so I put her in bed, so you know, she stopped screaming, and then like in a half an hour later, she was screaming again, and I said, 
do you need anything? And she said, I want to hear the truth, or this is how she said it. I want you to preach me. <laughs> and uh, like in my mind, I said, I'm not a preacher. And I thought, oh, well, Pastor John. <laughs> and I didn't say that, or but So I said, what do you want me to preach you? And she said, I want to hear the truth. And so I told her, the tr I said, do you want to hear the truth? And I said, and she said, yes. So I told her, you know, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And then I told her also that, do you know Jesus loves you? And she didn't know about what she'd say, and then she just shaked my hand and she smiled at me. <laughs> so, yeah, I was tempting, or maybe step, something like that. And so last Friday, I shared that to them at our women's group. And um, so they said, our special sister Leslie, she's been talking to me about it. How about you don't know these people? Like, some of them are not saved, something like that. And I said, um, yeah, I thought about it. And some of them, like, sh giving me some wisdom. And I thank for that because I need that to, to use, you know, whatever my fear is. So that was Friday. And then so yesterday, around 10, I was charting and one of my residents was like screaming there. She said, I want to die. I want to go to hell. I want to die and I want to go to hell. I said, what's going on here? So I went to her. I said, you don't want to go to hell. It's not good there. And I said, you want to go to heaven. And he, I told him about how heaven it is. It's beautiful. No more pain, sorrow, and all this stuff. You know, stop. And he gave me a smile and I said, Do you know when I know Jesus? And he said, Who's Jesus? I said, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And so, yeah, I told him about Jesus and I told him, I said, if, Do you want to know Jesus? I said, If you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you know, in your heart, you will be saved. And I told him to repeat that. So, he did that, so I'm just yeah. thankful. I'm just like when I told Sister Leslie about it. <laughs> so that's all. <laughs> you know, I've been thinking about that song. We used to sing a lot in, in the song books. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but it goes like, I'm not going to sing it. But Come on. <laughs> bring them in. Bring them in bring from in the, the fields of sin. Oh. So bring in the sheep. Bring them in. Bring them in from the fields of sin. See, when we get together here, this is this is a time to to get refueled and to keep rubbing shoulders and to get filled up. And but we got to go out there and get them and bring them in. The first lady that that. So never talked to him, just smiled and shook her hand when he told her about Jesus. The, the, the other, the, the next guy mm -hmm. got saved. Amen. Whether they get saved or not is not up to you. <clears throat> but telling them about Jesus and telling them what you know is up to you. Mm -hmm. And anybody can do it. Yeah. Because it's not about us. <clears throat> the Bible says it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Turn in your Bibles real quick, and then I'm going to get ready to close. And, <clears throat> and uh, Isaiah 6, verse 8. Back in Isaiah. This is, this is a verse that, that really means a lot to me. It really ministers to me. <clears throat> Isaiah 6, verse 8. We've got to overcome our fear. We've got to overcome the feeling of not being good enough. That's a kicker sometimes, isn't it? You want to know the truth about not being good enough? None of us are. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about that. You, amen? Mm -hmm. yeah. God loves us, and Jesus Christ makes us good enough, but on our own, no. <laughs> How can we do a supernatural thing like leading someone to Christ in, in our own ability? All God's looking for is your mouth and your, your tongue and your feet and your hands. He wants to use you. 
And as we go through this life, we need to slow down a little bit and just be aware that there might be an assignment out there for us somewhere for that day. But look at this in Isaiah 6, verse 8. Then I heard the Lord asking, Whom should I send as a messenger to this people? Who will, who will go for us? I said, Here am I. Send me. That's what Isaiah said. Here am I. See, this is the New Living Translation, and it says, Here, here I am. Send me. But that's not how he said it, because I am, you put those two words together, that's God. Amen. He is the I am. So I, I switched up what the New Heaven Translation said. He, he said, here am I. Send me. My first year at Ramah, 2001, I was in orientation. September the 11th, 2001. The day that the, the planes hit the towers. And the dean of the school came out and said, we just want to inform you, because the whole student body is in the church, probably, you know, three, 4,000 of us. I just want to inform you that there is a plane that hit the World Trade Center. And then a little while later, he says, he says, one of the towers is on the ground. One of the towers collapsed. And he said, we're going to dismiss you. And I went home to my little apartment. <laughs> in Quail Hollow, and the kids are in school, and, and I sat there all day long, looking at that TV, just could not believe that. Those two huge buildings, just fireballs and crumbling, and just the horror of it, in New York City. I mean, it just blew me away. First year Bible study. And as I'm sitting there watching that TV, the Lord spoke into my heart. The Holy Spirit spoke into my heart. And he gave me information about these terrorists that the news didn't even come out with yet. The Lord already told me. And you know what he said? He said, you know those guys that flew those planes into those, to those buildings? They gave their life for that cause. It was the wrong cause. And it was an evil cause. But they gave their life for it. They had to learn how to fly those planes. They had to go through all that effort. They left their families behind. They, they, were, they were working for an evil cause, but nonetheless, they gave their life and they gave their heart for it, did they not? And the Lord said to me, first year Bible school, he said, will you give your all for my cause? Will you give it all for my cause? And to the best of my ability, that's what I have attempted to do, is to give my all. For this, this purpose that he has called me to do, which is to be standing here, being the pastor of this church. And you know, I haven't, I haven't always been perfect, and I've struggled just like anybody else, because pastors are human too. And I was laying in bed the other night, and the Lord spoke into my heart, and he said, he said, you got to shield up. you got to shield up, and you got to drop that shield. See, no matter how many ships we burn, we've got to remember that there's more ships going into the harbor. Ships that you can hop on and just take a take take a ride out, or, or God forbid, the nest of, of, of the comfort zone, the breeding grounds of mediocrity. God never called me to be a mediocre person. He called me to be full of fire, full of passion, full of zeal. And sometimes over the years, you can get hurt and you can you can get discouraged as pastors, and, and you can. Start to put a guard up. And, he's, and he was saying, I want you to drop that guard. I want you to drop it because it's going to affect the anointing. He's always working on his enemies. Yes. And I said what I said 18 years ago on my kitchen floor. Whatever you want me to do, I will do. Amen? God needs us. He doesn't need us going here and there and all over the place. He needs us working together. The synergism, the, the, the sum of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. We've got to pull it together. 
You know, they say a pastor makes the church. I don't believe that. I believe the church makes the pastor. I believe as a church prays for the pastor and prays for the people. Invest in this church. Invest in, in what God's calling us to do. They will, they will find the treasure of what it's like to be sold out. Why are you looking for a field over there? You got a field here. And there's sometimes some people want me to help them and want to do things. And I'm like, I can't help you. You're not committed here. <laughs> you're never here. You're not here. How can I help if you're not here? <clears throat> when, you, when you go through things as a pastor, you go through things in the ministry, you suffer rejection. I can't tell you how many times I've been rejected. We've had ministers come right in this, this church, right in amongst us, and reject, at least me. But what did I say? No matter what circumstance I'm in, or no matter what negative words spoken over me, I never let it change the fact in my mind and in my heart that I'm where God called me to be. I'm in His will. And there's no one's ever going to take that out. If the Lord hadn't spoken to me in such a sound, profound way, I wouldn't have ever made it. But I want to keep listening to the voice of the Lord. When that Hagen said at Ramah, she said a long time ago the Lord spoke to her uh, and she didn't listen. And she just re reasoned it away. You've got to be careful because you can reason away the voice of the Lord. And, and, and you know what she said? She said, the Lord stopped talking to me for a long time. I said, so I didn't like that. I didn't like that at all. I don't want that. I don't want the, the Lord to stop talking to me. Because I talk to him all the time. And, and, and Lynette Hagen said she had a long journey. She, she, she was, um, went for three hours with her son and her husband, three hours to visit a person in prison. And they were in that prison for two hours. And then on their way back, they stopped to get something to eat. And they're tired. They were so tired, Pastor Hagen said, you guys go in, I'm going to sleep in the car. He is 80. But they went through an awful lot to go visit someone in prison. Cards are nice, letters are nice, calls are nice, but sometimes people need to see your face. And a lot of times they don't care what you say, they don't care what you say, they just, they just know that you were there. And she's sitting in this restaurant and she overhears the lady behind her, her waitress, talking about how if she gets the money she's going to get these special orthopedic shoes. She has some kind of condition in her feet. This is a waitress. We know what waitresses do, right? They stand on their feet all day long. And she's hearing this, and, 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 and the Holy Spirit said, I want you to give her the money. Because she's telling this other waitress about how much it's going to cost. And, and Lynette is just listening here, just listening behind her. And, and, and she's like, oh, Lord. You know, people spend, people, you know, they give money, they, they spend it on drugs. They spend it on alcohol. They spend it on this or they spend it on that. And, and so she went into the bathroom. And she said, Lord, I need a stronger voice here. <laughs> and the Lord said, yeah, it's me. I want you to give her the money. You're her supplier. And that's what she said, Lord, I'm going to do it because the last time I didn't listen to you, you didn't talk to me for a long time. <laughs> And she went out there and she talked to this lady and she said, she said, you know, the Lord told me to, to give you money for your um, orthopedic shoes. I overheard your conversation. The lady didn't even know who, who uh, Lynette Hagen was. She wasn't even saved, probably. And, and Lynette said, but I want you to spend it on those shoes. Please don't spend it on anything else. You've got to get those shoes. And the lady said, yeah, I'll get them. I'll get them. I'll get the shoes. I promise you. And, and they said, okay. And Lynette said, um, try to be my friend on Facebook and I'll, and I'll, I'll be your friend. And, and so they did that. They hooked up. A couple months later, this, this waitress sends Lynette Hagen a picture of her in her new shoes. <laughs> and she said, I had enough money left over to get the cream that goes with them too. We can't be so fast-paced and so, so busy and 
so comfortable that we can't ever say, if it weren't for the grace of God, there go I. Amen. And all through the years, we've been burning ships. We've been lowering guards over our heart. One day, Leslie and I are helping a lady in the, in the pantry over there, and this lady that, that, that she calls about 20 churches and gets help everywhere, and we're just helping her again, and, and we didn't really feel like being over there, to tell you the truth. I'm just being honest. Can I be, can I be transparent and vulnerable here? Because the Lord said he wants me to lower my guard. And the reason people don't lower their guard is because they're afraid of rejection. But the Lord said, if they receive me, they'll receive you. My sheep know my voice. If they reject you, they reject me. And, and I wasn't being a very good pastor at that moment. Because I wanted to get in and get out. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit said, just look at her. He's, the Holy Spirit has never spoken to me audibly. He spoke to me in that still, small voice in here. He said, look at her. And I stopped and I looked at her and I seen this I could just, just see it. Just she beat down, run down, just hurting. And I got my heart right. And I said, wait a minute. I said, let's pray. And so me and, and Leslie and this lady, we got to serve and we prayed. And I felt the anointing so strong in that little building over there. This is what God wants us to do. He wants us to give us give him his all. Would you rise, please? I'm going to ask for the prayer ministers to come up. <clears throat> this message has been about will you burn your ships? Sometimes we think we burned our ships and then other ships come up in the harbor. Where'd that ship come from? You know what that's called? Compromise. It's called being comfortable. You've got to burn those ships too. Paul said, I've run my race and finished my course. And I've done the, I've done the work that you've called me to do. <clears throat> I just want to just, just, just worship the Lord just here for a second. Father, we thank you. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. Thank you, Father, for this message. I thank you, Lord, that, that you poured into my heart and I poured into their hearts, Lord. Father, we thank you and we praise you, Father, that we are your children. And now, Lord, I just pray that each and every person that's here, Lord, Father, that if they need to burn the ships, may they turn their hearts right now. May they turn their hearts and burn those ships and, and, and lower their guard. May they trust you again, Lord. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the anointing. I thank you for the anointing that breaks every yoke and destroys every bondage. I thank you, Lord, that we're called to greatness. We're called to make a difference. We're called to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, Lord. Father, I thank you for the power and the might that comes from you. I thank you, Lord, that one touch from you and they'll never be the same, Lord, as they open their hearts to you right now. Glory be to God. We praise you. Just open your heart to the Lord right now. Today could be the day that you turn it around. Today could be the day to find that treasure. Today could be the day that you say, God, I'm going forward in you. And, and I'm going to hear that still small voice. And I'm not going to be too busy to help others. And I'm going to love my church. And I'm going to practice my purpose. This is what the Lord wants from you today. Is for you to practice your purpose. To worship Him. Worship Him. And glorify Him. Don't worry. Don't worry, says the Spirit of the Lord. Don't worry about defending yourself. I will defend you. Don't worry about those things. Because if you try to defend yourselves, this says the Spirit of the Lord, you'll get over into pride. You'll get over into confusion. You'll get over into contention. I will lift you up. I will lift you up. Follow me with all of your heart. I will speak into your heart. I will show you things to come. I will bring you the joy that you don't have anymore. I'll bring you the love that you've been lacking. I will put the gas in your tank says the Spirit of the Lord. For do not forget that I created you. 
I brought you into this kingdom. I am the one who declares in my word that I have a plan for you. Plans to prosper you. Plans to get you the whole way through your life so that you can fulfill what I've called you to do. Have I not said in my word, says the Spirit of the Lord, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? I want you to look to me this morning that says the Spirit of the Lord, and I want you to trust me. I want you to let go of anger, let go of fear, let go of the feeling of not being good enough, and trust me, and follow me, and open your heart up to me. When you put me first place, that says the Lord, I can shine through you in a new and glorious way. Glory be to God. We thank you, Father. Glory be to God. Right this moment, just speak to the Lord. If it's your desire to give him your heart, give him your heart. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Lord, I break every bondage, every stronghold right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I break every bondage. Lord, I speak to those hardened hearts, if there be any, and I command them to be soft and to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. For, Lord, there's none of us that are too old to do your work. There are none of us that are too young to do your work. There are none of us that have done too much wrong in order to do your work. We, are, we all qualify. We all qualify. Jesus is the qualified. I just feel that it, it, just this, just this presence of the Lord real quick. If you if you would like for me to pray for you, just come up here right now. And, and if you want to just if you, if you just want to make a commitment, a further commitment to build, to burn those ships and to leave that stuff behind, and, and and you just want that power of God and that. That presence of God in your life. I want you to come up here right now. I'm just going to lay hands on you and pray for you. <clears throat> in Jesus' name, glory be to God. 